of the live events, and you can click on this image of the program, and you'll see all of the various live sessions. You just click on the session that you want to, to watch, and you can access it that way. Um, you also, sorry, let me move my, um, down here, you can access any of the on-demand videos from the conference, and we've got them organized by theme. So I'll just click on engineering mindset, and you'll see here um, crossing the finish line with the NASA STEM stars, for example. Um, one thing I'll tell you as you look at the list under those themes, if it has this teal background, that means it was a live session originally, and we've got all of those posted here for you. And Jan, when you stop sharing, would you mind just putting the link to that conference page in the chat? Yep. Yep. Then it'll make it easy for everybody to find. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. I, I was just going to say the certificate is fairly new. Those just came up, I think, in December. If you need a certificate for your hours, you can get that on the site Jan's posting too. Right. It's right here in the middle of the page. Right here. You just click on it. Um, Kim, I don't know if you want to explain what they do here. Yeah, it's a fillable form um, on the honor system. So you'll just keep track of your participation in the conference live sessions and then any on-demand videos that you view um, and mark those and then you can turn those into your whoever's in charge of PD for your organization and you can go back to these on-demand videos anytime. So that's a good place to find the, the list of all the, the videos too in a real short <laughs> <laughs> version. And then quickly um, I'll if uh, Jan, stop sharing. So I'm going to share quickly. So we have um, our Stay Connected website. I think hopefully you're seeing that. We have a refreshed look and a new um, a new energy around these uh, webinars. We really wanted to focus on having more of a conversation with experts and bring you into the conversation. So thank you so much for joining today's webinar on behalf of the Get Connected Conference partners. We are really glad that you are able to join us today. Um, on this site, you'll find uh, another certificate that you can access to get um, um, credit for viewing a uh, one of these webinars either live or after the fact we also post the recordings and we have started listing those by theme so you can see on this web page if you're interested in environmental and outdoor education you can click there and just see all of the stay connected webinars that we've done in the past hopefully that makes it a little easier to find what you're looking for and let us know if you are um, having any trouble finding anything you're interested in accessing. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our facilitators, Sandra Friedrichs with Nebraska Extension and Emily Koopman with the Belmont um, Community Center. And they are both um, here to facilitate some really great conversation today around the work that they're doing. So thank you, Sandra and Emily, and I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Kim and Jen. So what we want to talk about today is really um, taking care of yourself and um, building resilience for yourself in, in this COVID era and also with your staff. And we want to start out just by recognizing that there's a lot of stress, a lot of fatigue in our lives today. We were talking about that a little bit as we were chatting that um, 2020 was a tough year um, for a lot of people, the toughest year they've experienced. And um, so we want to start 2021 by focusing on what we can do, what we have control over and how we can support each other, um, support the staff that work in our programs. And we're going to share some resources with you that can help you um, help us all be more resilient together. And 
one of the things I wanted to talk about today is um, compassion fatigue. It's really an occupational hazard, I think, for people who are working with young people. Um, when you approach students and you're open hearted, you're, you're willing to connect with them and um, listen to them, you put yourself at risk for compassion fatigue because um, that can be exhausting when we're working with kids that are very stressed. Our colleagues, adults who are very stressed uh, and worn out, that can wear on us. And if we're dealing with our own stress at the same time that we're dealing with the stress of colleagues or kids, that, that's even more stress, more likely to lead to compassion fatigue. And I wanted to just have some conversation about this today to talk about it to let people know it's okay to not feel good right now. Um, it's not a sign of weakness or incompetence if you're feeling that stress and, and fatigue. It's also not a sign that you're heartless or uncaring if you're not, because we all deal with stress in different ways. And it's important to acknowledge how we feel and accept our feelings, whether we're feeling stressed out and um, experiencing that compassion fatigue, or if we're not and we're doing okay. And that's, that's all right too. Don't try to guilt yourself for feeling okay. Sometimes I think that's easy to do today with how everybody's talking about um, their stress and trauma. Um, so I'm gonna let Emily introduce herself too and she's gonna put her two bits in here. Thank you. Um, like mentioned, I'm Emily Koopman. I am um, the executive director at the Belmont Community Center which is um, different than the Belmont Rec Center. Most people think that I'm in the Belmont Rec Center, which is attached to Belmont School, but I'm down the street. The community center is its own freestanding um, community center, much like um, Malone is, um, built around the same time as Malone in 1955. And so um, I'm down, down the street from Belmont School. Um, and previously I had worked for community learning centers for five years. And so, um, and then before that I was in Chicago for before and after school programs. So um, this expanded learning opportunity um, space has kind of been my space for the last 10 years. And um, in regards to the, our topic of fatigue today, something Sandra and I talked about was, um, it may not even be compassion fatigue, but just plain fatigue at this point, right? We, um, there's, we're just tired. There's a lot going on um, in the world and then also in our workplaces and our home lives. Um, a lot has changed. Something we talked about is um, during this change, you're constantly um, having to get back on the horse. And that in itself is exhausting. So you're constantly having to um, try, new, try new things. And that is probably par for the course if you're working with youth at all is that you're constantly trying new things, you're constantly trying to adapt. Um, same with being a manager, um, trying to adapt and, and figure out um, what motivates people and when. And so I think that um, when we talk about compassion fatigue and just plain fatigue, um, part of that comes from just the constant cycle of trying to kind of get back on the horse and um, be able to kind of hone in on your craft of caring for people and then lays in a whole different set of needs. So um, I think something that I've learned in terms of um, working with youth and being a manager is really tuning in to capacity. That was a conversation um, Sandra and I had while we were prepping for this is I, I think it's really beneficial to tune in to the capacity, um, specifically when you're a manager and um, then you're tuning in to the capacity of your staff. Um, everyone has different capacities and there's no right level of capacity and fulfillment and kind of filling the cup up of someone's capacity is all, all looks different as well. So I want to give you a couple examples. Um, I think that one, I, I, I would encourage you to always just ask. You can ask students too, for sure. You can ask students and you can ask, um, your, your staff, if you're a manager, you know, 
what, what does capacity look like for you, whether it's in a day-to-day -day moment, say we're talking about after school, so from three to six, what is a person's capacity? How much time, for example, can a staff um, be the person who supervises the gym? For me, I would prefer to be in there for 15 minutes or less. I hate supervising the gym. I think it's the hardest thing of all time. <laughs> so, um, and that kind of creating physical games like that just doesn't come naturally to me. Um, but then there are staff who say, yeah, I would rather be in the gym. Please don't put me in charge of arts and crafts. And so figuring out those capacities and, and strengths really is what keeps people at their full capacity to give well. And so if someone is built up while they're helping with crafts or helping with the gym and so on, and, and knowing that it can fluctuate day to day, maybe arts and crafts is my thing, but today is still a real stressful day for me. Um, and so maybe if I could help clean an area after we get low staff and you don't maybe need me in ratio anymore, like can I just organize a space in our center by, our, by myself? Um, those are the kind of questions and the kinds of um, things you can tune into um, as a manager so that during the working hours, um, your staff are, are able to operate out of capacity and come back the next day as well. So um, Sandra? Yeah, I have a, a few signs of stress or fatigue, and I think that's a great follow up to what you just talked about, because it can help you tune in to to whether staff are, are struggling uh, and um, you can then use those strategies Emily talked about to maybe redirect them or find something that's going to better meet their capacity for for this day. So some of the things that you might see in yourself or your staff are increased irritability and impatience and as Emily suggested maybe just changing duties for the day so that your job is to organize the craft closet may really help deal with that that's one of the things when i'm stressed i like to organize something else that isn't the problem but it makes me feel good to see that that progress that idea of it's something i can control and manage um, staff may be having difficulty planning activities and lessons so you may need to change how how that happens to give them some extra support it may be hard to concentrate i know working remotely that's been a real issue for me and again there may be things that you can change about your routine to help um, your team concentrate and stay focused when they need to worry worry over your own family um, worry over your kids and the kids in the program and what their families are going through all of those things can be a sign of fatigue and also the feeling of being numb or detached. Uh, as we said, some of those things are, are things that you can deal with. You can change your duties for the day. You can um, listen to what people need and, and support them. But sometimes it's too much to do it yourself. As um, managers or program leaders, we're not a healthcare professional. So if you notice that yourself or your staff are really suffering from fatigue, stress, um, trauma, and it it's ongoing more than two weeks or three weeks, it's time to look for a professional to seek some counseling that can someone who can help you you deal with that because it isn't something that we all have to bear on our own. It, there may be days when we're doing better and days when we're not and that's okay but if you're just finding it's not working every day look for some help that that is something that is important and if you're in a school there may be um, support within that school talk to your administrators find out if there's some way that you can find some help or if not reach out within the community emily i know one of the things that you talked about was how important it was for you earlier in the pandemic to really focus on those things that you could control and that you um, 
could keep use to keep yourself busy why don't you share what worked for you yeah um like Sandra said I really tried to hone in on things that I could control and um small things too so that I could feel that daily win that I I did something I accomplished something um whether it be for myself or um for work purposes and so um something small during the pandemic was um, I just wanted to get 10,000 steps, just, you know, every, I don't know about y'all, but I love the steps. It's a very, I feel like typical thing in like young, uh, young people working with young people. Um, we love to get our steps in. So, um, but yeah, sm focusing on those small things and then knowing like, at least I got that done for myself today. Um, in whatever case that may be, um, sometimes it, it doesn't have to be, about physical health, it could be um, reading a book a month, or it could be more long term or whatever um, works for you. Um, but I think too that again points back to I, I really needed a place for my intensity to go. I'm a pretty intense and fast moving person. So when the pandemic hit, and I was at home with my five year old, um, I was like, Oh, I got a lot. I got a lot going on. And I can't, uh, I can't let it um, seep out um, onto Max, my five-year-old, or in my workplace. Like I have a lot of intensity. Normally, I would go to a gym. Normally, I would um, be at a program from three to six p.m. That's full of hundreds of kids. That was a pretty good outlet <laughs> uh, to to make sure that I was uh, my just on on the roll kind of brain was moving and acting fast, and so figuring those things out um, for yourself. And I think that brings us to a place where we talk about if you are a part-time staff or if you're a full-time staff, everyone still has a manager, has someone above them. And so sometimes um, the manager can't tune in to what you need. Um, we are learning today as a group um, about tuning in as the manager to our part-time staff, but also um, any part-time staff who are here or, or will be watching later um, or if you as well, advocating for yourself. What does that look like? Um, I think it's really hard. I think it's really hard. And that's why I put a lot of pressure on managers to tune in and to ask the questions and take that accountability to take care of whoever, whomever is directly reporting to them. But I think advocating for yourself, something that I had to realize while working from home from March through August almost, um, was I had to schedule in uh, time with Max, time with my son, because people would look at my calendar and be like, she's free, let me throw this on her calendar. She's free, let me throw this on her calendar. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm, I literally am making lunch right now, you know? And so <laughs> it, was, it was one of those moments where I was like, no, no, I'm gonna do that. And then people would still put things on my calendar and I had to be able to say to them, no, even though it's 10, 15 in the morning, from 10, 15 to 10, 45, I take a 30 minute break with Max. Cause I can't, I cannot ignore my five-year-old for an eight, for eight hours straight. Um, not to mention thinking about my own personal capacity of being in a, a two bedroom apartment. So I'm sitting in my living room right now, which if my son was here, he would be in my living room, you know? So there was not a lot of space for us to spread out. And I think again, that is the manager's responsibility then to advocate for whoever is going um, whoever is part of that process and trying to figure out what works for them at home or at the workplace if you're working um, with kids at a location. Um, but I, again, I just think that putting a lot of accountability on managers is, is super important. Um, and those are some of the resources we're gonna talk about today as well. But again, I'd, I very much understand that um, we also have to advocate for ourselves and let people know what we need. and. Um, when people ask, tell them, because if a manager is asking you, they do want to know. They're not trying to make a checklist. Um, so definitely if someone asks, let them know. And if you don't know yet, I think that's another process. It took me a long time to figure out what I needed um, in terms of what it means to now work from home. So it's a self-care checklist might help with that too. Yeah. Yes. Lead in with that, Sandra. Okay. <laughs> So one of the resources that we have in the box folder you can download, and we'll post these with the recording too, is a three-page um, checklist of, of things that may 
be that piece that you can control that can give you a daily win and, and help you feel better. As Emily said, for her, that that's getting her steps in and, and making sure she's active and moving every day, accomplishing that goal of 10,000 steps. But for you, that may not be the piece that's going to make you feel better. But this checklist will give you lots of different ideas about what you can do to take care of yourself and put yourself first. And most of them are not things that are going to take a lot of your time. But it's a good place to go to look for those strategies that can help you be more resilient. And it's also a resource you can share with staff if they're looking for those sorts of, of, of resources as well. But one of the things we were considering is for a lot of us, our primary role is really working with staff, managing. And um, sometimes that is, is an additional struggle. And Emily introduced me to Kim Scott and um, what she calls radical candor. And Emily, why don't you tell us about those resources and I'll put links to them in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I just sent Sandra a couple kind of blog posts that were on um, kind of Kim Scott's Radical Candor's webpage. Um, I brought my book. I do own the book Radical Candor by Kim Scott. So um, I always would recommend that comes in a good audiobook format too for um, those of us who are moving and shaking. So I love a good audiobook. Um, but yeah, I essentially, I, I think that what it really talks about is um, being able to, well, one comment she had was she felt just like an emotional babysitter you know she was like well i got projects and plans but am i just this emotional babysitter of my part-time staff and someone said uh no taking care of your staff is your job and that you know needs to be a priority so um one of those links talks about that a little bit and i just feel like the book in general is um filled with with a bunch of good wake-up calls it felt like a very good wake-up call for me um in a lot of ways and um, helps me both as a manager and as an employee um, state my needs in a way that um, I forget what the specific language is, but just being able to state your needs clearly um, and kindly and, um, and then work, work from that end, both as a manager and as an employee. So. So we've got a couple of other resources and, and I will put those in the chat in just a minute uh, about um, some what it means to be resilient and self care specifically for educators, since that is our field. We've got about five more minutes, so I wanted to open it up and see does anybody have questions um, issues that you're dealing with in your program you can. Um, on mute and talk and join the conversation with us or just type in the chat if that's more comfortable. Uh, but I wanted to know if you have things you're struggling with or if you have strategies that are working in your program, something you're doing differently now that is making everybody's life a little bit easier. Hi, so I, I have a question. My name is Victor. I am the site director, the school community coordinator at Campbell Elementary School. And I've been working here for about three years with the same group of people. And so it's been really easy for me to kind of foster that trust and to, to see where my staff members are coming from and then relate to them. But I'm running into the issue of now having to hire on new part-time mm -hmm. staff members. There is no way to fast track that trust but what are some strategies that could make me look like someone who is approachable or someone who is actively looking to foster that trust with new part-time staff members? You're really lucky, Victor, to have that much continuity in your staff. I think that is a tribute to your leadership and to Emily's that you keep your team, you've kept that team together. That's really outstanding in our field. Emily, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I mean, I think the I think a a universal way to build trust with new staff is for you as the manager to consistently um, 
take accountability. In our field, things go wrong all the time. There's always a surprise. There's always something going on. Um, there's always a space where we could have communicated better. Um, and then I think, so I think in those instances, right, you always take accountability and you kind of just cut your losses. Even um, I, I too am working with a new staff to me. Um, and so at some point I just say, you know what? Yeah, I didn't say that to you. You can't do that again, but I didn't say that to you ahead of time. So that that is on me. And now as a whole group, we understand. Um, and then I've had, I personally have had a lot of personal conversations um, and, and I've had a lot of personal conversations when something didn't feel right. When I knew my part-time staff um, felt, you know, like it was a really hard day or they felt like they were in conflict with a, a colleague. They felt like they were in conflict with a parent or a student, or they didn't know how to handle a situation. Those are the times, in my opinion, to slide in and to really make sure that you are taking care of that part-time staff. You are teaching them because what they, what they don't need is for you to say, well, that's okay, it's not your fault. What they need is for you to say, um, here's how we make that better. And so giving staff skills as soon as possible is also a really good way to um, maintain trust specifically in this after school program field um, and with outside partners too. So outside partners coming in, not right now maybe, but um, when outside partners coming in too, maintaining relationships and building that trust is making sure they have as much information as possible. Um, but you're right, it just happens at the speed it happens, you know, some people you just vibe with right away and some people it takes time, but if they are, if they feel knowledgeable and equipped in the work they're doing, then you have time to build that relationship. I, I think the, the site you shared, Kim Scott's work on radical candor is a really good place to start thinking about how do you balance that um, sincerity and being honest and straightforward that's an important part of building trust and um i think she does a good job in how she talks about that so that's another place i'd recommend looking about what is that balance between being caring and being and holding people accountable and how can you do that in a way that's going to build trust i think another just a tiny note another thing you have um to your advantage most times is there might be someone else on the team who already connects with that person. Um, and so letting that person take the lead, you don't have to be the first person ever on the team to build trust with the new employee. Um, there's other people and then um, using those other people on the team to say like, hey, you, you know, thanks for really onboarding um, this new staff. Like, I see that you guys are working really well together. It boosts up your current employee to make sure that you're giving them credit where it's due, but you're also not like forcing your way in to try to build trust with your new employee. You're kind of letting that organically happen and supporting it, which in itself is gonna build trust for you. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and um, reiterate again that you can find these resources in the chat. If you want to save the chat, there's three little dots at the bottom right side of the chat box and um, it will let you save these on your um, computer so that you can go back and look at those resources that we've shared, go to the box folder or to the um, ran Radical Candor website. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us um, this is an important topic to think about how we take care of ourselves and how we take care of our staff. And I think it really connects well to what we talked about in December about the social emotional needs of the kids in our program. If we don't take care of our own needs, we can't be there for them in the way they need us to be. So thank you all. And Kim, do you have anything else to say before we finish up? I want to say thank you um, so much, Sandra and Emily. Um, I will definitely take some time to look at those resources and appreciate all of the great information you shared. Really appreciate it. And thanks to uh, those of you who joined today also. Um, Jan, do you mind giving just a little preview of our next Stay Connected webinar, which will be held on January 21st? 
Yeah, we hope you'll come back and, and bring more staff with you. Uh, we have Megan Crawford. She is the 21st Century Director of the After School Program in Broken Bow. And she's going to be talking about how she really um, developed a professional development plan strategy for this school year based around um, her, she and her staff listening to the Other West Moore, which was um, an audio book provided to everyone that attended um, the Get Connected conference. But she also incorporated some of the online on-demand um, breakout sessions from the conference, in particular the two that were are posted on our website by Laron Henderson. So she's going to um, talk about how she um, she's working on the title, but it's going to be something along the lines of um, you can build up your kids by building up your staff. So we hope you'll come back and check that out in two weeks at noon. Another great connection to our topic today, and we'll keep building on that to help you be great leaders in your programs. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you on the 21st. Thanks for joining.